What's going on? What's going on? What's going on? Today is Sunday, December 29th, 2019. And if you are listening or watching, you are listening and watching to the Marston Brothers podcast. It is Sunday. It is the last Sunday of 2019. What is going on, sir? Marvelicious, marvelous. Happy Sunday, fun day, y'all. It's great to be back another week for the Marcelin Brothers podcast. Gosh, so Sunday, fun day, you said. So why don't we talk a little bit about your day, your weekend? What was going on? How was it? <laughs> I mean, I like this the way that Sunday, fun day sounds, but I will tell you that the wife, she's gone. She is on vacation. She's in Egypt. Egypt, what? Egypt. Yeah, so she uh, a rightfully needed vacation she's gonna be there for two weeks she's with her sister her brother and her mother however i because i'm a resident i don't have that much days that i can take off therefore i was not able to go this year however in the future i do plan on making some more world trips so i am home and uh what i spent this week and doing was uh working on my rental property all right so i've been working on there Doing a lot of like yard work, so I'm I'm sore. And then I periodically I would look down on my iWatch and I realized I had a full day's workout. <laughs> um, I've reached my my step goal. I've reached my minutes for exercise goal as well as the overall caloric burn goal. So I was like, wow, I didn't have to work out today because of that. <laughs> but yeah, I know I... I'm gonna wake up tomorrow morning sore. Yeah, yeah. But hey. I I, uh, I enjoy it. Um, I put up a new railing, and ah. then I uh, I cut down a tree. <laughs> what? Yeah, man. And I'm just going down the list of. There's something called a use and occupancy. For those of you who are not aware of it, basically, whenever a purchase is made for a house, if you plan on either living in it or renting it out, the township comes by and they give you a checklist. And that checklist are the things that you have to fix in order for the township to deem that place to be up to code and um, livable. So I just had a couple little things that I need to take care of. And um, in the township that I'm in, um, outside of my new house, um, there are three steps. And those steps didn't have a railing, so I had to put that up. And then the other stuff I'm doing is like cosmetic stuff. So I was playing around and, you know, I purchased the railing. It's uh, one of those steel um, iron or steel handrails. And um, I had the price for how much expert insta- installation would cost. Mm-hmm. And I figured, you know what? Let me try to do it myself. And if I can't do it, then I'll just call for help and get mm-hmm. the experts to do it. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. you know, surprisingly, it worked out. I went to Home Depot. You know, I asked around, how do I do this? Uh, they told me, okay, you need to have. This type of anchor, you're going to be drilling into cement. You need to have um, this type of drill bit as well. So I got the things I needed to get. I used my my hand drill that I already had. um, But I will tell you this. I have a cordless hand drill. And the hand drill would die (laughs) on me because I'm drilling into cement, if you can imagine. And, you know, I was able to do it. It's just one of those uh, slow and steady wins the race type of things. But then I was thinking to myself, if I had one... I was hooked up to power. Mm-hmm. I could have still done it slow and steady, but faster because I wouldn't have to wait to recharge the the battery. Um, so I had to do that, you know, halfway, a couple times actually. How but, many screws did you have to screw in for the handrail? So altogether. the handrail altogether, um, there's four screws or yeah, eight screws that I had but, to take there. So four per handrail, and you had to do two handrails. It's like it's like one handrail, but it just has two places. Um, in the ground that you have to drill in, and then each one of those places has four screws on them. Okay, so it, this is bolts. so this is walking up the stairs into the front of the apartment that you purchased. So you don't have it on two sides that you have to walk. It's only on one side that you need it. Yeah, you only need it on one side, oh, okay. at least in my township. All right, um, all right. So you know. Good. I did it, and I'm happy with the progress and how it looks. Um, and, you know, I think it was a job well done. And then the other thing, 
our um, screens. So I now know how to put up screens. I've, I've done that with my first property. So on that checklist, if you will, I had to reinstall screens to like the front door and then the back door. And so, you know, because I know what I'm doing, I just go to the store, buy the screens, and I just put it in the same day. Um, so if you guys need help putting in screens, I'm your guy. <laughs> so you're talking about you've got the screen door and you just have to replace the screens on the screen door? Yeah. Yep. All right. Very good. Well, you know, I, in my patio, I've got the screens in and there's some holes that I have in some <laughs> of the areas. So I may need to call you then. We may there have to go. do another FaceTime visit. Well, very good. Well, you had mentioned sore. So speaking of about being sore, I'm actually feeling kind of sore today. So this weekend was a good weekend for us. We ended up on Friday. We did mom's famous fish fry. So the fish fry was a very good success. We had lots of family coming out. Again, the fish fry, for those of you who aren't as familiar with what we do for the Marston family reunions, is we literally will, you know, we won't necessarily fight ourselves, but we'll buy, you know, snapper, we'll buy, you know, grouper, tapia, you know, whatever fish we think about we'll buy those it's already fried and then we'll get some appetizers and then in addition to that some other courses and we'll just put it all together again it's my mom's piece that she does during the holidays because every household has a responsibility so you know one of my aunts she's responsible for doing christmas my other aunt is new year's and then my mom she needed something so she does the fish fry that's in between the two of those so fish fry was good a lot of fun a lot of people hang out and then after that we did a little karaoke action so the karaoke was fun you know we had you know my sister-in-law's family she they were in town so we had an opportunity to partake in some karaoke. So that was really fun. And then Saturday morning, ended up hanging out with, you know, the other Marcelin brother and his wife. And we ended up going to a bounce house. Not a bounce house, a trampoline place. And you know me Ooh, trying to be like silly. Sounds like a lot of fun. Oh, yeah. So I'm doing backflips, but and I'm trying to do wow. front flips. And... I, you know, you have more guts than I do because I've been to some trampoline parks. But then I'm just like... I'm not even going to try. Like, I jump really, really, really high, but I don't even try doing backflips or front flips. Marvin, I'm surprised. I, I figured you, out of all people, would have been the one because you are the most athletic out of all three of us. So I definitely would have seen you as the type that would play around, do some flips just to see what happens. And if you fall, then you fall and you bounce and then you get back up. So next time we do a trampoline house, you're going to have to come out and we're going to have to do it. But we'll see, man. We'll see. Means, I mean, I'm clear, I mean, I didn't land everything, so I was falling. You know, I'm falling on my back, falling on my side. But it's not a trampoline, so you bounce a little bit. But man, when I woke up on, when I woke up this morning, I I definitely felt muscles that I hadn't felt in a while. Between that and then, of course, I was lifting on each of those days, so I definitely felt the soreness. And then Saturday night ended up having the engagement party for my brother and sister-in-law, so that was good stuff, good times. We had some music. Ophelia, she just loves to dance. She was the center of attention with everybody. So she was just <laughs> making it work like a boss. So between that and then the sports that were going on with the bowl games, it was just a great weekend. So I can't complain about that at all. And I even got some housework in because the next celebration is going to be New or New Year's. So I'll I try to set up the house for that. So did the lawn. So we should be ready to go. Amazing. Amazing, amazing. All right, man. So we got a couple. Ooh, I, one, 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 one last thing I want to put in there. You know, yeah. you know, the New Year is coming. And have you started to think about, you know, some New Year's resolutions and whatnot? You know, I've, I've never really been. I've never really been that New Year's resolution type of person. I mean, I've got stuff that I want to do. Like goals, like I've got financial goals, I got work goals, relationship goals, family goals, stuff like that. But as far as like a, as a resolution to to do something, and I make myself do it at the beginning of the year, and then I just see how far I go along. That's not really me. So I've got the, I mean, I've got a pretty good, you know, structure and the things that I try to accomplish every year. So for me, it's not really. Nothing out of the ordinary that I'm saying, hey, I want to try to do this or that. It's it's more of just 
keep it on, keep it on what we're doing now, just following the formula for me. I do know, though, is, you know, I've been going, you know, I, I go to the gym every Saturday, Sunday, sometimes Fridays as well. And then I do my running every other day. But it's nice to be in the gym right now because there's nobody in there. But I do know, like it happens every year, I'm, you know, whether it's the first or the sec- probably the second, you know, whatever that first weekend is, that gym is going to be crazy packed and it's going to be annoying. I'm going to have to wait for machines. So that's the one thing that I don't like about the new year is everybody trying to say, hey, I want to try to work out. Let me go to the gym. And then I don't get to do my machines the way that I do do it. So that's the one thing that I don't like. But for me, it's the same. Keep it on. Keep it on. What about you, man? I think something that I'm interested in trying to do is thinking about the concepts of um, systems. Uh, I've realized a lot of the most successful people out there have their own systems. So if you get to the point where it's like a set in, forget it type of thing, and you just stick to your system, and as long as it's part of your system, you get it done. And I want to actively start working on creating a system, maybe start by listing uh, the priorities that I want to get done and setting a goal for all of those priorities. But if I incorporate a system like, okay, I'm going to be dedicating this much time to this, this much time to that, this much time to that, and then I um, actively work on it year-round, I think that might be able to make me more of a well-rounded individual. So I want to figure out what my system is going to be. Oh, I think that's great, and especially with you, with where you are, you are finishing your last six months of residency, and then you're going to be transitioning into a full-fledged attending podiatrist. I think for you... Having these systems are going to be important because in the residency, you kind of do have some structure. And even though you're doing stuff on your own, there are some boundaries that people will keep you from, you know, doing gutter balls, essentially. So for you, you that I think is something good for you to think about, because once you're intending status, no one's going to be looking over your shoulder and say, hey, you forgot to do this. OK, that's on you. So I think that is good for you to set that up as one of your goals going into your 2020 year so that's good yeah yeah and it's even the little things like you know when i was younger i used to play music (laughs) i want to add little blocks of time where i'm like okay every day i need to dedicate at least 10 minutes on whatever instrument just because that makes me happy and then just the ability to dream and then have that that time and that space where you can start to you know set different goals that you'd like to strive for because i find that it's very very easy to just get caught up in one thing or another maybe it's just your work you know and you're not giving yourself enough time to fully um, allow yourself to do other things to make you more of a well-rounded person so i want to dedicate time for those other little things that make me what i am I think that's good, and it's a good time for you to establish those things. So if you want, as the MVP crew, for us to just, you know, check in every once in a while, ask you how you're doing, once you figure those out, that's what we're here for. I mean, the MVP crew is a community that helps support the individuals who are there. So let us know when you're ready, and then after that, we'll make it work. Oh, for sure. All right, so let's set up these stories. So... Shall I go first or shall you go first, Sir Marvin? I think I will go first. All right. Let's do it. All right. All right. So I got an article from CNN, um, and uh, I think you guys might enjoy it. So the title is, These Smart Shopping Carts Will Let You Skip the Grocery Store Line. This is by Matt McFarland. Tired of staying in line? Wait a bit longer, and you may never have to again. Everyone... From Amazon to Silicon Valley startups are trying to eliminate lines in retail stores. Amazon has opened 24 of its Amazon Go stores, which use cameras and artificial intelligence to see what you've taken off shelves and charge you as you walk out. Some startups, such as San Francisco-based Grabanjo, are closely mimicking Amazon's approach of AI-powered cameras mounting in ceilings to identify what you've removed from a shelf and then charge you for those items. But others are trying an entirely different route to skipping the checkout, which are shopping carts, smart shopping carts. These companies have added cameras and sensors to the carts and are using AI to tell you 
you've placed, tell you what you've placed in them. A built-in scale weighs items in case you have to pay by the pound for an item. Customers pay by entering a credit card or by using Apple Pay or Google Pay. When a customer exits a store, a green light on the shopping cart indicates that their order is complete and that they're charged. If something goes wrong, the light turns red and a store employee is summoned. The stars behind the smart cards, include, including Caper and BB, say it's much easier to add technology to the shopping cart than to an entire store. Amazon's ghost stores rely on hundreds of cameras in the ceiling. The shelves also include sensors to tell when an item is removed. So far, Amazon has focused on small format stores of about 2,000 square feet or less. Amin Beshni, the co-founder of Caper, believes the technology to run Go is too expensive to use in a large format grocery store. Amazon reportedly considered expanding to thousands of the Go stores, but it's only opened a couple dozen so far, possibly adding um, credence to the point that they're expensive to operate. Two of the stores are currently closed for renovations. Amazon declined to comment for the story. Neither Carper, Caper AI nor Vivi has said how much their smart shopping carts will cost, making it difficult to compare the different formats. The CEO of VV said he's finding increased interest from retailers given Amazon's steady expansion of Go since opening the first store in Seattle in 2018. We're always happy to see when Amazon is doing something, Siddiqui said. They force retailers to get out of their old school thinking. BB is testing several of the shopping carts in an unnamed Seattle retailer. It's announcing a larger development in early 2019. And Siddiqui says the company is in talks with two of the country's 10 largest retailers. Siddiqui said the shopping carts will eventually offer customers real-time coupons. When a customer puts, say, peanut butter in the cart, they may be offered a 10% discount on jelly. But there are still kinks to work out in the technology. Caper which has small pilots in Canada and New York City, is currently having customers scan items on a barcode scanner built into the cart before placing them in. Uh, the process helps teach the AI system to identify the store's items. Anytime a business uses artificial intelligence and cameras, it raises questions about customer privacy and the impact on jobs. Beshri notes that the cameras in his shopping cart point down into the cart, so only a customer's hand and part of their arm will be captured on camera. Siddiqui said he's envisioned grocery store cashiers shifting to roles where they, free, where they freely float around stores and answer customers' questions, a format similar to the Apple Store. Wow, there's so much going on in this article, but you know, I, because I am a bit of a technology geek, I do like to hear and see how um, different stores are beginning to think outside of the box and go into the next century, if you will, and see how they can make the experience of shopping easier and, and faster. And I'm assuming this could be something that will make um, shopping a little more affordable as well. But to every situation, every action, there is a reaction. And towards the end of this story, they mentioned that um, – What's going to happen to a lot of these customers? Well, you, I'm not customers, but the employees. Um, if you are a cashier person and that's what you do, what happens when your job is no longer there? Are you going to be willing to shift roles, learn a new trade, become a new, maybe a tech person to help people when things get slowed down, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? I don't know. But this is something that is really exciting, and I uh, just wanted to hear what you thought about it because this stuff fires me up. I'm loving it. No, I think that, and we were when we were talking during the show notes section before we started the show, we were even talking about how has technology already started to interact with us when we we're going into the grocery stores and when we we're going to markets. I remember there was a time, you know, just like two or three years ago, where you would see. You know, you would have each of your shopping lanes, your checkout lines. You would have an individual manned in each of the checkout lines. And you kind of just go through the rigmarole. Cashier greets you. You do what you need to do. And then that's it. And then you keep on going. And I feel like within the last two or three years, 
I've seen stores experiment with self checkout. And for me in the beginning, I was always like, ah, I don't want to do self checkout. I want the actual person to check me out. But when I noticed in certain lines, in certain stores, how the lines were long and then the self checkout lines weren't as long, I figured, you know what? I mean, what's the worst that could happen? I mean, if I need help, there is somebody who is there that will check me out. So the stores that I noticed this the most are some of the common stores that I shop at. So I shop at BJ's a lot. So BJ's is Berkeley and Jensen. So they are kind of like a a wholesale store where you're able to get items for bulk. So very similar to Sam's Club or Costco. And then I also noticed this at Home Depot. That's another store that I go to now because being a homeowner, you know, I'm always over in Home Depot's. So I'm in there a lot. And then Walmart, actually, I noticed those things as well. So when I go into those lines, I find it, you know, pretty easy, pretty simple, you know, to scan. I mean, I've been watching people scan items all my life. So, you know, a lot of stores, you just scan the item. You put those items into a basket or a or like a conveyor belt area. And that conveyor belt is weighed. So once you scan the item, then you have to place that item on that scale and it won't let you continue with the next scan until you actually go and place that item onto the scale or you press a button that says, you know, too heavy and you don't do it. So I now notice when I'm at these stores, you know, there's usually one attendant that's there for maybe seven or eight different checkouts. And I do feel like the throughput is a lot quicker. I do see that a lot more people are going through the lines and people are getting checked out a lot quicker. And for those individuals who do have questions, then that person is there. They can, you know, either raise their hand up or they, you know, something will happen to the actual light that is on that checkout area. And then you'll have your individual come in and they'll troubleshoot the issue. So this is something that I'm just seeing now. So I feel like the logical, the logical next step is, well, what can you do to avoid the checking out piece altogether? So, you know, weights, I think is very interesting. I think if you have barcodes that are on the cart somewhere, as you put the item into the cart, you know, you can scan it. So then you're able to put it in a cart. I think that along with what we were reading in the story about sensors being on the shelves, that makes sense to me. And that would probably be the next logical step. And then depending on what store you go to, if you're going to one of these Amazons or Googles where your information is already on file, all you do is you log into your cart and then you do what you need to do and then boom, good to go. So I think that's excellent. I think it's great. I think that it the technology makes us better. We're able to be more efficient. And the thought would be, well, what do you do with those individuals? Like you said, do you now change what the responsibilities of those individuals? And are they doing more inventory management, inventory control stuff versus greeting? Do you have any of them set up like security where they just make sure that people are doing things the right way? But I feel the cashier piece, removing them out and repurposing them to do other things that might be more value added to the store would be a good move. But you do also have to pay for this technology. And what I'm assuming is that, you know, depending on how much a cart, and again, I have no idea how much a cart would cost. Would a, would a cart cost $20,000, 30, 40, 50, 60,000? I don't know. But I feel like if you're thinking about individuals, Unfortunately, depending on what type of jobs these are, they may not be the most highest paying jobs. So you may have a lot of turnover, people wanting to support their families. So I feel like there's a lot of money that goes into human resources, finding the right person, recruiting them, training them. After you train them, they start working. Once they start working, they they may need time off. They may need to be sick. So I can see, again, not me personally, but I can see from your Amazons and your Walmarts, you know, how much it costs to keep people doing stuff. So if you're able to just put the people where they need to be and you are able to find different things that, you know, AI can do, 
again, not replacing the person, but just repurposing that person, you may be able to make that store a better functioning store. So I like where it's headed. I'm a proponent of it. Yeah, I, I do like where it's headed as well. And um, just it'll make life easier, I think, because a lot of times when I'm at Walmart, uh, sometimes there's a long line and, you know, long lines are annoying. <laughs> but if you could find ways to decrease those long lines and you know, utilizing a technology to do it, to me, it's a, a win-win situation. So as a customer, it will make my experience more streamlined, a little more fun. So I'm all for it. However, I can see where there's a lot of kinks that they may have to figure out. Like, for example, if you're shopping with little kids and they grab stuff and you don't necessarily want them to grab that stuff, will you get charged for it? And then, you know, will this be a new uh, area for hackers to try to figure out a way to beat the system? And if they do, uh, you know, will the losses come first full circle and then the the customers are going to be the ones that actually have to pay for it with, you know, it's little things like increasing prices for everything in order to, you know, rack up and uh, account for the losses that they've lost if hackers and people start to steal. But then I think about credit cards and the same thing, but they've created systems where even if your identity was stolen or your credit card was stolen, um, they're willing and happy to reimburse you, get everything straightened out. And so the actual consumer isn't the one who's hurt. So I think if they go and they try to make sure that at the end of the day, the service is to provide a service for customers and the customer is the one that you're trying to uplift, I think if you put them first, this will be a fantastic uh, new addition and a plus to the whole entire retail economy. And I think that the individual companies that take this technology in full stride will be handsomely um, reimbursed by more people wanting to check out the stores. For me, like if I find that the store has this, I will be willing to just go to the store and just try it out for myself. <laughs> Yeah, and I think and when we're looking at this article, it looks like the team members who are, or not the team members, the companies that are trying to do this, you know, Amazon. Amazon has revolutionized the way that shopping is done today. Amazon, as we used to know them, they used to be that online bookstore and people used to do stuff from there. But the whole presence of online shopping, if you think about it from that perspective, that has changed the dynamics of how people shop. So you already have individuals who aren't going to stores as often. For me, you know, I'm okay with ordering something and getting it in two, three days versus depending on when I need it, depending on what time of the day it is. You know, with me having a family, sometimes getting out of the house after a certain time, it's just even if the store is down the streets, I sometimes would rather, you know what, I'm going to order this thing. It's going to come on Amazon. It'll come to me in two days. I could do it in the comfort of my own home. You know, if I am in the middle of watching a game, if I am doing dishes, if I'm about to make my lunch, and all I have to do is go to my phone, click on it, and then in a couple of days it comes in. For me, that is worth the price of admission. So that's already one thing that Amazon has done to revolutionize things. And I feel like in the past, people are probably very fearful of, hey, should I be putting my credit card online and are people going to be hacking? And and it, it happens. And unfortunately, it's one of those things where, you know, if you're not smart with it or sometimes a hack gets you, I mean, that's something that unfortunately is going to come with the territory. That's like the same thing as saying, hey, if I put money into my wallet, you may have a pickpocket that comes in and steals my wallet. I mean, that is something that is a possibility and then also just when you're going into the checkout lines and you know in the past it used to be you would give your credit card over to the cashier and the cashier would swipe it but now you just put it into the pin so these are all areas where individuals who try to buck the system will look at these vulnerability points and with that figure out a way to be able to do it so when i'm thinking about 
you know, are there fears with individuals who will be going to these stores and hackers to break into their stuff? Yeah, I think those are legitimate, but that's where you have stores like Amazon who are very, very big in infrastructure and very, very big in cybersecurity to figure out those things to do. And I think that these aren't going to, I mean, at least within the next five years, I don't think that's going to be the norm. I think you'll have some stores that are do that, but you'll still still have some stores who are still old school. Like, for instance, with Apple Pay, not every store has Apple Pay. You know, some of the stores that I shop at have Apple Pay and some of them don't. And that's like one of those things where with all technology, you'll have your early adopters and then you'll have, you know, different companies who may want to cater to a different crowd who maybe prefers the the one-on-one thing because just as you go to the store to get stuff there are individuals who want to find somebody and want somebody to talk to them and and want that conversation so it might be a niche in the beginning until it becomes full circle but I think that there are going to be options in times where you can't just not have anybody in stores and nothing really replaces that human touch. So I think a lot of it will probably depend on who it is and what you're shopping for that will help determine whether or not you would have this type of technology in that store. All right, all right, all right. I mean, that was a great discussion. But how about we transition to your article? All right. So this was something that I actually didn't know until I was looking for articles. And again, as the MVP crew, we are here to share information and news for you guys. So this is an ABC News article. The name of the article is Trump administration raises legal age to buy tobacco in the U.S. to 21. This story is written by Stephanie Ebbs, and this was written on December 27th. So, again, this is something that is pretty timely still. So, President Donald Trump gave a stamp of approval last week to raising the federal age requirement of who can legally purchase tobacco products to 21 when he signed spending bills approved by Congress this week. With the president's signature, the change will soon make it illegal for anyone under the age of 21 in the United States to purchase vape products, and e-cigarettes, as well as more traditional tobacco products. The Food and Drug Administration confirmed in a December 21st tweet that it will update its regulations and intends to submit a final rule within 180 days. The FDA, however, released a statement on its website suggesting the rule could go into effect sooner. It is now illegal for a retailer to sell any tobacco product, including cigarettes, cigars, and e-cigs, to anyone under 21. FDA will provide additional details on this issue as they become available, the statement said. The new regulation comes amid nationwide concern about the increasing nicotine use among young people and the possible health risks of electronic cigarette products. Youth tobacco use became a point of discussion in Washington as the prevalence of e-cigarette use and vaping among teenagers seemed to skyrocket. Through the issue garnered more attention due to hundreds of vaping-related il- this is across the country, raising the age to purchase tobacco won't directly tackle that problem. The Centers for Disease and Control and Prevention have traced the products problems to listed the THC products adulterated with vitamin C. Tobacco use has long been a concern in the United States in both health problems connected to combustible cigarettes and the addictive properties of nicotine, especially in young people. In 2018, 12.5% of middle school students reported that they use a single tobacco product, compared to 31% of high school students, a CDC survey found. A CDC fact sheet also shows that more than 34 million adults in the United States, about 13.7% of the population, are cigarette smokers. A bill to raise the legal age to buy tobacco from 18 to 21 was introduced earlier this year by Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell and Virginia Senator Tim Kaine. It was combined with another bipartisan bill on the issue to become part of a spending package. Along with updating the rules about how to enforce the new tobacco age, the FDA is starting to evaluate applications for e-cigarette products it says are on the market illegally to determine if the agency will allow them to be sold or place restrictions on where they can be sold and how they can be marketed. The Trump administration has not yet said how or if it will enforce a ban on all flavored nicotine vapor products that was announced by the president in September in an effort to stop more teenagers from taking up vaping. Public health and anti-tobacco groups praise the change but still want to be 
more to be done to curb youth vaping and tobacco use overall. So that is news to me. When I am looking at this article and some of the items that were discussed, I did know that there was a big thing about the whole e-vaping and how they were finding lots of individuals who were getting sick from using these. And I did know that the FDA was looking to be more stringent on that usage, but the whole change of the legal age to smoke from 18 to 21, that was something that was totally new to me. So what are your thoughts on why the legal age is being changed to 21? And what are your thoughts on having that actual date change versus keeping it to 18? Now, as a healthcare personnel, um, I'm in line with the thinking of of the administration when it comes to uh, this particular cause. And, you know, personally, I think, uh, you know, smoking, especially for its, um, you know, addictive properties should be like diminished as much as possible. Um, and I understand the lore of the, the e-cigarettes uh, because I think initially, they were trying to argue that it was healthier than traditional mm -hmm. cigarettes. Mm -hmm. And um, that got a lot of people thinking. And then when they started adding in, you know, the new flavors and whatnot, because the other aspect that people complained about was, you know, the, the nasty smell yeah. to some people, what they call nasty smells, um, which was from the, the tobacco from cigarettes. And now that you have e-cigarettes, um, the scent that you smell when other people smoke it, you know, it's very refreshing. So that definitely caught on. And now the look of, of smoking and being able to puff out all that smoke, you know, to a lot of people, that's very enticing, especially it, it's very dramatic. So I think that led to a lot of um, younger people trying to, to smoke the e-cigarettes and, um, you know, eventually news got out that e-cigarettes themselves are not healthy. Um, they're just as bad, but I don't have the data to say that specifically. However, um, it became a problem when the numbers started to show how many individuals are utilizing e-cigarettes. So I think this was a move to curb that and... Um, you know, if you're going to do this to e-cigarettes, then you might as well do the same thing to, to cigarettes as well. So I think that's why out of the, all of a sudden now they want to um, increase that age from, you know, 18 to 21. I think it's because of the e-cigarette phenomenon. And if you're going to ban or if you're going to change the, the age for e-cigarettes, you got to do the same thing with traditional cigarettes as well. So I think that's what's going on. Um, I am... I, I agree with this uh, decision. I think this is a good thing. But again, I'm coming from a healthcare personnel point of view. I think the thing that whenever I see rule restrictions when it comes to age, and depending on what that age is, I always look at the argument that a lot of people talk about is if you're 18 and you can be drafted you go to war, you can vote, but, and these items that are being discussed are things of huge responsibility that can affect the generation because at the age of 18, you have the opportunity to cast your thoughts on rules and regulations and you have the power to be able to voice your opinion and make that count so i guess i always struggle with if you're going to give citizens pretty much the the most important rule the most important action that they can do which is to vote on things as well as you are willing to have 18 year olds 
fight in wars, then why not give them the responsibility and not give them the authority and the autonomy to be able to make decisions on smoking? And I mean, you can throw drinking into that as well. So that's always the argument that I always think of is then you can't have your cake and eat it too sometimes. Now, again, I understand the why behind it and the thought processes of the 18-year-old versus the 21-year-old. There should be differences. You have opportunities to be able to develop more intellectually in your mind. You have more experiences. You should be able to decipher things a lot more because of the three-year age. But again, it's if if you feel like you need to be 21 to do those things then do you need to look at changing the the voting to 21 and fighting in wars is 21 so that's my whole argument when it comes to that again I get, like you say too I am a healthcare practitioner and I do believe that one way to try to curtail disease and to curtail negative behaviors is by restricting it but at the same time, my thoughts are always, if people really want to do it, they're going to do it. They're going to find ways to be able to do it. That just means they're going to do things under the table. That just means that they're going to have somebody else buy something for them, and then they'll do it there. That just means they'll just do it in private. So maybe the, the people who just want to try it because they want to try it, and the people who aren't serious users fine maybe it curtails them but it's not really getting to the root of the problem the root of the problem is should you allow these types of products period that's where i'm looking at it yeah yeah and and you actually made a very good point which was um, this is going to prevent individuals who are 18 from purchasing them but correct me if i'm wrong it's not illegal for an 18 year old to smoke the products question mark is it just you can't buy it but if someone else gets it to you and you're using an e-cigarette um you know in an area that you're allowed to smoke will you get in trouble or fined if you are an 18 year old, that's my question. Um, so that's, I don't. Yeah, that's a very good point. I mean, I'm reading verbatim what it says here. It says it is illegal for a retailer to sell any tobacco product to anyone under 21. So it almost makes it seem like it's going to be punishing the retail store to sell it, not necessarily the person who is using it. So the details are very important to look at, and you may have a, a point of how they're trying to control it because if the only way to control it is to find the people who are selling it, not the people who are using it. So that's a very good point that you bring up. So good catch. So we'll see what happens as time goes on. So we just finished these two episodes or these two stories. Why don't we talk about our, you know, wrap up? So what do you want the audience to leave with with the article that you just talked about, Marvin? With my article in regards to the the e shopping carts, you know, I think we ought to continue looking at furthering technology, um, making it better, and utilizing it in ways that will streamline our lives. So I'm all for it. I think I am excited for when I get to actually participate and utilize an e-shopping cart myself or just one of those types of stores. So for me, I think we should embrace technology as it changes as opposed to run away from it because technology is always changing and you don't want to be left behind very cool and then again my article was talking about raising the legal age to buy tobacco in the united states to 21 years old 
And for me, it's it's a couple of things. But I think at the end of the day, it's first off, realize now that, you know, between 180 days from now, maybe even sooner, you know, 18 year olds are not going to be able to go and and have tobacco products being sold to them by retailers. And again, the whole purpose of this is to try to control this epidemic of individuals who are using tobacco products because tobacco products have health risks that can be detrimental to the individual and in turn that can be detrimental to family members and colleagues and friends and eventually that is detrimental to the country as an as its own it's a you know individuals will have to have therapies for lung disease this means that days of work are missed which means you need to put more resources into making sure these individuals get better. But then also at the same time, it increases healthcare costs for individuals. So I think in looking at preventative medicine from a healthcare practitioner's perspective, this is one of the ways that the administration is trying to curtail that they're trying to do something about it. But I think that there is a balance between how do you you know, decrease the risks of individuals who are using these products for those diseases and infringing on the rights of United States citizens with regards to things that they can and they can't do. And it looks like the happy medium with doing this is not necessarily penalizing the buyer of the product per se, but penalizing the store who is selling it so it's like an indirect way of being able to do that but if it's something that you feel you know is important then you know use your voice and see what you're going to do to change that but it looks like this is the administration's way to be able to decrease you know potential risks of health and you've got about 180 days to either do something about it or make sure that your voice is heard. Well said. Well said. All right. So what do we got going on for the rest of the week before we wrap it up? What's going on, Martin? It feels weird that, you know, the new year is going to be in the middle of the week, you know, as opposed to like towards the end or towards the very beginning. But I do want to say, and kind of give a shout out to myself. Ha ha ha. Guess whose birthday's coming up on the second? Gee, I wonder this if who it is. Yes, this yes, guy. yes. Yeah, man. So it's going to be another fantastic year. Um, the beginning of the year is always fun and exciting. Uh, so we'll see what ends up happening. Before I forget, what are your plans for New Year's, man? I haven't figured it out yet. So. You know, I usually spend New Year's down in South Florida, but I was not able to do that because, number one, I'm on backup call. And then number two, I just don't have as many days off. And I, you know, it kind of stinks, but hey, it is what it is. Yeah. Um, but I'm not sure. I need, to, I need to figure it out. My wife's in Egypt, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not really sure what I'm doing. So if you have any suggestions, hit me up. Um, I am interested, but most likely what I'm going to do is find a group of friends and, you know, just take in the new year with them. There you go. Very cool. Very cool. So at the Marston family household, so, you know, my wife and I, we, you know, when we were dating, you know, very early on, and even while we were married for the first year, we used to go out on new year's and everybody knows getting ready. You, you know, you want to bring in the new year, right? You know, you're with your significant other, start end the year with them and then begin the year with them. So for us, we went to, you know, a couple of things. And what we realized is wherever we went, it was always packed. There was always long lines. Things were always expensive. And half of the evening, you were trying to get ready for that event. And then once that event was there, it's already gone and it's passed. And we realized the money that we were spending going out It'd be a lot easier for us to just host our own party, you know, do our own entertainment, 
have the people who are closest to us be able to bring in the new year with us. It's a lot safer. And you get to spend time with the people that you enjoy the most. And it's relatively inexpensive. So, Leah and I, we've, this is the third third year that we'll be doing this. And, you know, we have a DJ who does a little bit of DJ, you know, being me. We do some karaoke. We have some, you know, I like to say whores divorce. But they're hors d'oeuvres, but I do refer to them as hors d'oeuvres. <laughs> and again, you get to hang out with the people who are closest to you. You know, very chill, and we try to have fun, and we make it work. So we will be doing that again this year. So looking forward to that. That sounds like a blast. And another thing that I, um, I'm going to continue doing is I have found a new hobby, which is making little mini movies just memories you know and and the little ones are like one minute or less so i'm going to continue doing that and what i challenge you my friend is to make one of those during your new year's celebration party and send it to this guy me because i usually come out to your events if i can and i'm not gonna be able to this year so i would really like it if you do that so challenge to you hopefully you accept it yeah, we'll have to see, man. I mean, I'm 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 the host that does the most. You know, I do a little DJ stuff, Eric stuff. So we'll hey, maybe we'll be able to do it. We'll see. We will see. All right, Marcel Brother Podcast Crew, thank you again for listening to us on another episode of the Marcel Brothers Podcast. Please, 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 if you haven't done so already, please subscribe. You know, if you like what you're hearing, because. We want you to be a part of the MVP crew. In addition to that, please feel free to share your comments with us. So please go to any of the places that you listen to podcasts. Just Google Marceline Brothers Podcast, and you're going to find us there. So please feel free to put a comment in there. Let us know what you like. Let us know what you don't like. If you want to email us specifically, you can email us at Brothers at gmail.com. And we love getting emails from our fans. And with that being said, this is the last podcast of 2019 for the MVP crew. So we are looking forward that the next time that we'll talk to you, we will not only be talking to you in the next year, but we will be talking to you in the next decade. 2020, another decade is upon us. Yeah, yeah. I'm hyped, man. I'm hyped. Let's do this. Let's do it. Let's do it. So again... There is Marvin. Here is me. We are out. Thank you again for listening to us. And we will talk to you guys next decade. Deuces.